as we get closer to all of the Bitcoins being mined, I'm worried that there's not enough incentive to the miners. And then what happens? Do we all collectively agree on a 1% inflation? And then once you cross that barrier, what stops you from becoming the monster that you're trying to fight against? Sure. Uh, this is always theoretically possible, though it's one of those things that's you know, many years away, I think, from becoming a crisis. But I'm pretty optimistic about the incentives. Uh, first of all, I think it's pretty amazing that Bitcoin has survived for 14 years. That basically shows that the, the incentives in the game theory that Satoshi constructed were quite robust. And I think that there is good reason to believe that those incentives will continue working as expected. And I mean, you only really have to look at what's been going on in the past few weeks and months. We've actually had uh, periods of time in which the transaction fees have been greater than the block reward. And of course, since the block reward is getting cut in half in a few months, it's going to be even easier for transaction fees to more than offset that. So I think we, we already have at least some proof of concept that this is possible. Of course, there's so many different factors at play of really what will create demand for block space and therefore drive the transaction fees and, and help to uh, pay for the miners and basically the thermodynamic security. It's also a tricky question because no one really knows what the quote unquote right amount of hash power or right amount of, of energy is that's needed to keep Bitcoin relatively secure. So uh, Satoshi did get some things wrong though and and they, they fixed them. Um, you know, they actually, in the very first releases of the Bitcoin client, they they were incorrectly using the the length of the blockchain to decide which which fork of of a valid blockchain was correct. And pretty quickly, they realized that that wasn't great because anybody can just create a bunch of blocks with without much proof of work. So they, they fixed that pretty quickly to instead be whichever fork of the blockchain has the most proof of work is considered the best. And you know there were a number of other changes over the years of you know, uh, removing some opcodes that uh, could have been used to essentially destroy the consensus of the network if, if they had been exploited. And um, beyond that, I think it's pretty clear that for the past 10 years or so, uh, Bitcoin has functioned quite well, but where we're at now, it's it's more of a theoretical issue of you know what changes, if any, should be made to Bitcoin that will make it more valuable and more functional without accidentally introducing some exploit that could cause the whole system to fall apart. Um, you know, there, it's good that Bitcoin development is conservative and that uh, people are thinking very adversarially about these things. But on the flip side, one thing that I think a, a lot of people don't keep in the back of their mind or they don't put enough weight in is the fact that this system is anti-fragile not because of the software, not because of the hardware. It's anti-fragile because of you and me and everyone else who is interested enough in watching what's happening, in contributing in whatever way we can with whatever skills and resources we can. And that it's, it's really hard for me to envision a catastrophe that would actually cause Bitcoin to... Uh, to, to fail permanently. Uh, we've, we've seen plenty of examples where Bitcoin has failed temporarily due to technical issues. And what happens is if, if machine consensus stops, then you fall back to human consensus and then you fix the problem and you move forward. You know, this is why Bitcoin is resilient to almost anything. It's because it's comprised of now, you know, probably millions of, of people scattered all around the world who are um, incentivized in seeing it continue to succeed.